Okay, good evening, everyone. It's uh, just at 5 p.m. Uh, West Coast time, so we'll get started. Uh, welcome to the AO Trauma North America webinar series. Tonight's topic is pelvic ring injuries, which ones need surgery and which do not. My name is Connor Clavino. I'm one of the orthopedic trauma people at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. I'm here tonight with a couple of great people, uh, Justin Haller from the University of Utah and Jason Nascone from Shock Trauma University of Maryland. And one of the great things about doing activities like this with the AO webinars and conferences is you can be invited by previous uh, mentors like Dr. Nascone is for me, and you can invite previous mentees of yours like Dr. Haller is for me as well. So I appreciate both of them being on uh, the webinar tonight. Just a little bit of household uh, items. Our um, conflicts are here as well as on the website. Uh, all of your microphones will be muted during, um, during the webinar, uh, but please use the Q&A for questions and we'll have some time at the end uh, where we'll proctor some of those questions. So what are we talking about tonight? So clearly this fracture, this is a young patient involved in a high energy motor vehicle crash with substantial pelvic ring deformity. Uh, you know, I think we all agree this, these are ones we need to fix, okay? That, that's not what we're talking about. Talking about something more like this type of injury. So here's a young patient hit by a car in the crosswalk. You see a little crack in the obturator ring on the right side, you know, cracks in the, uh, in the sacrum on the CT scan if you scroll through it. And so, you know, you can take this patient to the operating room and you can look at it under fluoroscopy. Maybe you push a little bit and it moves a little bit. You push a little more and it moves a little more and you push a little bit more and it moves a little more and then you let go and it recoils back. And so you may say, well, that moved, I need to fix it. Or you may say that didn't move very much. I don't need to fix it. What about this person? This is a 75 year old that fell off a ladder while working on his ranch. And, and he's been in bed for two days in the hospital, really unable to mobilize. And every time he rolls in bed, it, it hurts too much to get out of bed. And you can see he has no real significant pelvic ring deformity. You can see a couple of cracks in his obturator rings bilaterally. And if you scroll through a CT scan, you can see a, a, a non-displaced zone two sacral fracture. So the objectives tonight are to number one, learn some options for evaluating for occult pelvic instability. And Dr. Haller is going to talk about that. Understand the current data requiring pain relief from surgical stabilization of some of these pelvic fractures. A lot of people say, well, we should fix it because it hurts. And, uh, and then to recognize some of the controversies when considering operative versus non-operative treatment for these. So the agenda, we're gonna start with Dr. Haller talking about um, is the pelvis stable or unstable? I'm gonna talk about some other indications for fixing these. And then we're gonna have Dr. Nascone lead us into some case examples and discussion. So with that, I'm gonna uh, stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Dr. Haller. Yeah, still muted there. All right, thanks, Connor. Um, so like you said, we'll be talking about assessing pelvic stability. And so before we uh, really get into this, we'll present a case. This is a 26-year-old female who fell while she was skiing. She's kind of got a minimally displaced sacral fracture on the right and minimally displaced uh, fracture through her uh, superior inferior uh, ramus on the left. And so hopefully by the end of this, we'll uh, discuss enough about a systematic way to evaluate these injuries and decide how to best treat this patient. So our objectives for this portion are to review some of the fracture patterns that can be successfully treated non-operatively. We'll hopefully identify those bad actors um, that may have some indeterminate stability and, and then talk about techniques to assess pelvic ring stability um, for those indeterminate ones. So why are we even discussing this? Well, it's because it's a little bit controversial among surgeons. So this is a survey study that was conducted on over 100, 100 OTA members that really showed only about a third of cases had substantial agreement and really only fair operative um, agreement on uh, LC1 fractures. And this was independent of surgeon experience, both in terms of years of practice and the amount of surgical cases treated. Another similar study um, was done at 16 different uh, trauma centers 
and accumulate over 300 pelvis fractures, looking for the same looking for the same answer. Um, and they really demonstrated there's little consensus among surgeons who routinely fix these fractures on which ones actually are indicated for surgery. They found that zone two fracture and posterior cortical displacement um, were correlated, but little other um, radiographic markers. So starting simply, who, sh who should probably get treated non-operatively? Um, and this is, a, this is a classic study done by Dr. Tornetta, where they had over 100 fractures with minimal displacement defined as less than a centimeter of initial uh, presenting displacement on CT scan. And they, nearly all of them healed uh, with few having um, more displacement than a centimeter. However, they had only 37% final follow-up and really didn't collect any um, uh, patient reported outcome scores. Um, another study uh, done by um, the group out of shock trauma had a similar question where they looked at LC1 pelvic fractures uh, with minimal displacement defined by less than a centimeter of presenting uh, displacement. And, and looking at their numbers, all of them healed. None of them had less than, a, had greater than a centimeter of final displacement and reported pretty good outcome scores with 42 out of 50 having excellent to good Majid scores. However, they really only had 50% final follow-up. So unsure how the other half did in, in their series. And then finally, this classic paper from Riley and Sims looked at uh, LC1 fractures with um, that were, had less than five uh, millimeters of initial displacement and treated them non-operatively. And what they identified was a certain cohort had a greater uh, likelihood of, of displacement. And those were complete sacral fractures, either unilateral or bilateral uh, fracture. And they defined uh, um, displacement as, as greater than five millimeters uh, once patients actually started walking on it. So why is it so hard to identify patients that are going to have residual instability? And it's because the pelvis is, uh, our initial imaging is static. So we're looking at static CTs and, and uh, radiographs. And it's tough to know how much displacement was present on initial injury. And it kind of gets back to the soft tissue attachments that are present on the pelvis that's maybe more, um, more like a dynamic type of evaluation as opposed to static imaging. And so this is what led to uh, the examination of anesthesia or EUA that was uh, first described by Dr. Saji, where he detailed the uh, steps to really evaluate the stability of a pelvis under um, using fluoroscopy. Dr. Saji's uh, group has had uh, subsequent publications, this one by Dr. Whiting, where they followed the patients with a negative stress exam and demonstrated that they all healed without residual displacement and um, actually did pretty well. A more recent study by uh, Dr. Marisek's group looked at the utility of EUA and if it helped uh, treating surgeons um, agree on whether a pelvis was stable or not. And they found that it actually did. And um, so this leads to the question, should we be doing an examination under anesthesia for everybody? The answer is probably not. Uh, there's certain anesthetic and a cost risk uh, for patients who go to the operating room for, for an EUA. There's also this barber chair effect where if you're going to be in the chair, you're gonna get a haircut or translated to, to pelvic fractures. If you're in the operating room, the chance that you're gonna get a surgery uh, likely goes up. It also raises a question or what are true indications for surgery? Dr. Saj's article in most articles it lists a cutoff of one centimeter, but this is really arbitrarily assigned and isn't really based on anything. Also, how do you measure a displacement of one centimeter on a fluoroscopy can be kind of challenging. And finally, have you provided enough stress on the pelvis to, to sufficiently judge whether something is unstable or not? So this led to um, a, a study that uh, out of our group where we looked at assigning a scoring criteria to LC1 fractures, where we su systematically look at sacral displacement, Denis classification, uh, whether the sacrum is complete or incomplete, and also look at the fracture morphology of the inferior and superior ramus and assign a score to each of these components. When scoring these, uh, pelvis fractures on CT scan, there's actually pretty good agreement among 
um, surgeons when assigning a score of five through 14. Uh, and then when we took these pelvic fracture cases and had um, OTA surgeons decide whether they wanted to operate or not, a score of less than seven, um, there was a greater than 90% of surgeons decided they would not operate on that fracture. If the score was greater than the nine, greater than 90% indicated that they, they would operate on that fracture, which kind of leaves this indeterminate zone of seven to nine for that scoring system. And if you look at the, the categories that um, really pushed surgeons to, to operate, it was the knee classification, complete sacral fracture and residual displacement, which is what we would all expect. And then finally in that paper, uh, we took the scoring system, applied it to Dr. Saji's original group to create this bar graph where uh, you can see in the light gray is um, negative UAs or patients that did not get surgery and the darker um, bars indicate the ones that did. And then again, you can see a, a nice transition from the seven to nine group where there's some overlap of patients who may be unstable and need an operation and those that also were uh, stable enough on EUA that did not get an operation. So next is, even though it helps you to determine maybe patients that might benefit from a, a stress exam or not, going to the operating room is, is still a significant um, undertaking for patients and surgeons. So recently there've been some studies to evaluate the utility of stress exam outside of the operating room. So this, study um, by the group out of Denver looked at lateral stress radiographs, almost like a gravity stress that's performed to ankles, but translated that to pelvis injuries. And so here they would have patients uh, lay on their injured side and measure the amount of displacement that they would have and had um, pretty good reported results. Obviously this can be limited by the amount of pain a patient has by laying on their um, injured pelvis and can also be impacted by your uh, rad tech and getting a good image of the uh, sacrum and vertebral bodies can sometimes be challenging. Um, a, another um, way to do this is oh, we published this out of our group. Well, it's under under publication, um, not hasn't come out quite yet, but where we uh, looked at doing emergency department stress radiographs again, similar to what's what we do for a ankle, where we prospectively enrolled 70 patients were presenting with an LC1 uh, pelvic ring injury. And uh, we were able to demonstrate that all 70 patients were able to successfully tolerate the uh, examiner anesthesia. And then when we compared the um, exam results in the emergency department to the ones that we obtained in the operating room, is a pretty similar overall measurement um, indicating that there, that you could make, um, you could obtain good information from a stress exam performed in the emergency department. And then we took this one for, further. Um, this was a, uh, sorry, this is a podium presentation of the, the, this last year's OTA, where we then took the uh, emergency department stress um, views that we obtained on the prior study and we scored them with this uh, Beckman score to look at the amount of displacement um, correlated with our Beckman score. And as you can see in the, on the um, line graph that there's actually pretty good correlation with the amount of displacement in millimeters with um, increasing Beckman score. And if I'm looking at this um, bar graph, you can again see the rate of successful or positive um, ED stress exam relative to Beckman score. And as you have an increase in the uh, Beckman score it correlates with a increase in positive uh, stress exam. So going back to our original patient, um, so here's her CT, one cut of her CT scan or AP radiograph. So scoring her out, she has um, pre minimal displacement less than two millimeters. So she gets a one. She has it, or um, and she has a Denise zone one, a three column sacral injury that, as you follow the CT scan up and down, you can uh, detect. She has a minimal inferior ramus fracture and a parasympathetic superior ramus fracture. So adding those up gives her a score of a nine. So based on our um, sequence, she would get an EUA. And this was before we uh, started enrolling patients in the emergency department um, EUA. But so this was done in the operating room. And for me, um, this is a positive EUA where the superior ramus um, goes all the way to the midline and is about a centimeter displacement. You might get some argument that that may not be a positive UA for some people, 
Um, but then this is how we treated her with a retrograde ramus screw and a, a single uh, transsacral transsacral screw at S1. So in summary, I think we can agree that incomplete and minimally displaced sacral fractures can likely be treated non-operatively and patients do, do well with this treatment. Um, for LC1 fractures with a Beckman score of seven to nine, I feel like this is an, uh, a zone where you have some indeterminate stability and doing some kind of stress view to help guide treatment is, um, is supported by the literature. And I think uh, moving to a ED stress or lateral stress radiograph is uh, beneficial for, for patients and for us has been proven to be safe and effective for determining stability for these LC1 fractures. Thanks. Thanks, Justin, that was great. So we'll see you in the ER cranking on people and just, I think they all tolerated it because you just held them down and gave the pain meds, but all right, so. It's, yeah, it's because I'm weak. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Yeah, get somebody stronger, push harder. <laughs> so, so to get back to this, so why are we talking about this? I mean, the, the minimally to non-displaced LC1 is literally one of the most benign injuries that we treat. And the treatment options are, you know, one, nothing, which is pretty benign, and versus doing a, you know, seven millimeter incision and putting a couple of perch screws somewhere. So relatively benign. Well, so a couple of reasons I would say why we talk about this. One, the incidence is high. Uh, two, the procedure is easy relatively for us. And, and then three, you know, is theoretically the fear that something bad is going to happen, right? So so one reason we fix these is because there's some instability that we don't see on static imaging, like Justin said, and then something terrible happens like this bad malunion. Now this case, you know, for full disclosure, this was a, you know, horribly comminuted zone two sacral fracture that nobody, I don't think in contemporary trauma centers would treat non operatively This is a patient from another country transferred in like months later. But you can see it, you know, this is a dramatic malunion uh, deformity and no one would want this to be the radiographic result of their treatment plan. So this is clearly malunion. Interestingly enough, she ambulates uh, independently. Um, she does use sort of a left buttock pad at times, but otherwise is relatively asymptomatic. Uh, but this is not what we want. Well, the other thing is, is this what we want? So this is a case of an LC1, very mild LC1 that uh, was treated non-op. And yeah, I mean, overall it looks okay. Um, there's a little bit of internal rotation deformity. Is that bad? Is it okay? So, you know, that's another thing. Or is this something that we're trying to avoid? Well, the other argument that people give, if it's not malunion, it's mobilization. So one of the principles of orthopedic trauma is early mobilization, right? Whether it's femur fractures, ankle fractures, or pelvic fractures. So we say, well, we want patients to mobilize well. And if, and if they have pain, uh, you know, from their pelvis fracture, they can't mobilize. Now, clearly, you know, I, I don't think any of, at least at our trauma center, the trauma patients are going to get a pelvic screw and jump out of bed and be an Olympic gymnast like this, right? Um, that's versus the elderly patient who falls and just, just can't mobilize. And we know from the hip fracture data that you know early mobilization is one of our principles and they walk a very fine physiologic line and sitting around in bed, uh, you know, unable to get up and mobilize, you know, maybe have much more um, profound physiologic consequences. So the question is, does, is, is pain important, right? So I would kind of put it back to you to think about this critically when, when, you, when you have a patient, right? So first of all, do fractures hurt? Well, yes, okay, we know broken bones hurt. Do stabilizing fractures make them hurt less? Well, of course they do, right? You know that from your pediatric experience, right? You take a both bone forearm and a kid and you put a cast on it, they immediately feel better. So stabilizing a fracture makes it hurt less. Question is, does it matter? Well, I would say it depends. Okay, so here's a humeral shaft fracture. You all know that you've treated these. Does this hurt? Yes. Does stabilizing make it hurt less? Well, of course, even a coaptation splint makes them feel better. And the times that you plate these, they dramatically feel better and they, they're glad that you fixed them, unless of course you give them a radial nerve palsy. 
But so if this in isolation, you say, well, that doesn't matter. That'll heal fine. You'll probably quote Sarmiento and you'll move on. But what if on the other side, they have a transhumeral amputation, they have bilateral lower extremities with an open, you know, needing soft tissue covers, they're going to be in a wheelchair for a long time. So that it, it may be important to fix this, to mobilize it. So can you apply this logic to pelvic fractures? So one thing that I get think gets confusing for people is they take the LC1 pelvis, and if you go back to like the original writings and talk to Dr. Burgess, that what they were observing were young people with relatively high energy fractures. So you had somebody walking in the crosswalk and get struck by a car. They brought them in to the ER and they saw an image like this. Okay, that's different than an elderly person that just falls down and that's a fragility fracture, right? So there's different mechanism, there's different biology and potentially I'd submit to you, there's relatively different consequences for these two injuries, even though they're radiographically maybe similar. So what does the literature say on pain? Because I think that this is something that we talk about a lot and, and because you know we're altruistic, we don't want people to have pain, so we wanna help them. So. You know, this study is from 10 years ago, Dr. Rout, a couple of my partners, Dr. Beret, um, kind of looked at 38 patients, retrospective, and this is in the day that we could publish stuff were probably a little easier than today. Um, they looked at the pain scores, so a pretty profound decrease, you know, 50% decrease from four to two. I don't know if that's meaningful or not, but, you know, most people felt better. Uh, the narcotics decreased as well. Now, this uh, study kind of included more than just the, the simple non-displaced LC1s. Um, so let's move on to the next one. So this is a study um, out of shock trauma, um, kind of a co-alumnus, uh, Jen Hagen from both the University of Washington and shock trauma. Does surgical stabilization of LC pelvic ring fractures decrease patients' pain, reduce narcotic use, and improve mobilization? So this is more focused on the, the LC1s, LC2s. They did find that the operative group mobilized, and you know that's a moving target that can be hard to, to measure. Um, but they did find in their uh, methodology that the operative group did mobilize a little bit earlier. But interesting, they didn't find a, you know, in terms of their measurements, a significant difference in pain and narcotic usage. So overall, that seemed to be about the same for this study. Okay, again, this is retrospective. So now we move on to a more pro, and that was just at one center. So um, prospective data. So this is, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Tornetta kind of led this study, multiple centers, uh, prospective, um, uh, looking at whether, uh, you know, this pain question can be answered. So they had almost 200 unilateral sacral fractures, less than five millimeters of displacement. And you know, obviously this is difficult to measure, right? You know, whether you're looking at CT scans or plain films, it's always challenging. We don't have a good gold standard for how we measure displacement. And I think that that's something Dr. Haller already mentioned, but you know, even not in the operating room, we still struggle with how to truly measure deformity. These patients were uh, primarily young, so the mean age was 38, and they had a group that was treated operatively, and it was uh, and a group treated non-operatively. But they weren't randomized, right? They didn't control for that decision; they just observed what happened. So the non-op patients, they did have a higher VAS score, so a visual pain score of 2.7 points higher in the posterior pelvis. And I thought that was interesting because, you know, as opposed to saying, does your pelvis hurt? They tried to specify, does it hurt in the back or does it hurt the front? Uh, assumedly trying to identify, you know, where is, where is the patient feeling this and where is the fracture moving? What's causing this pain generator? Um, so not really a big difference in the front, but significant in the back, at least uh, statistically. Um, this consent, uh, continued after both in the acute period, uh, 24 hours, as well as at three months, where the non-op patients reported a higher pain score again, although it was a, you know, a pain score difference of one point, um, both posteriorly and anteriorly. So we have a signal here of a uh, improvement of pain. You know, does that get back to our discussion? Well, if you stabilize a fracture, do they feel better? So again, most of these patients were young. It's observational, but the, there was no control for the decision for whether they got fixed or not. So clearly from a research methodology, you could say, well, did you take a bunch of patients that had 10 out of 10 pain and those people got the screw 
and the people that had six out of 10 pain did not get the screw. And then a day later, the people that got the screw felt better. So their pain score was five out of 10. And the people that were maybe tougher and had only a six out of 10 score, the next day they were feeling a little better and they had a five out of 10. So you showed no difference. We didn't control for why you chose those, whether that was um, a surgeon bias or there was something of, you know, radiographically, they didn't uh, report any differences amongst the groups, but was there some other confounding variable within there? Regardless, they found a very small pain difference that, you know, I think most people would agree was less than your uh, MCID for treatment effect. So now let's work, uh, move on to a little bit more rigorous uh, study model. This is a, a group, uh, Gerard Slobodian and the group out of shock trauma with uh, Dr. Ness going on there. So uh, much more rigorous study design is prospective, uh, multi-center, intention to randomize, although not all patients were able to be randomized. So they were placed in a, a, a prospective arm that was monitored. Um, so they had about 100 patients less than uh, 10 millimeters of displacement. And then obviously surgery versus non-operative. And they found a 1.2 point reduction in, in their pain scale. And this was true uh, at three months and then persisted um, up to a year for the follow-up. Uh, interesting, interestingly, and I would say intuitively that severity mattered in their group, right? So the worse the fracture, the worse the pain and the bigger the difference in their um, uh, the pain difference. Um, interestingly as well, they did not find that time to mobilize or length of stay, uh, they didn't find it, they weren't able to measure a difference there. So, um, you know, maybe we were able to um, decrease their pain, but our principle of we're saying, okay, we're going to mobilize these people better. Um, they weren't able to, to measure that. Um, again, this study did have a cohort that was slightly younger. Um, so trying to separate that idea of a, a young, uh, relatively medium to high energy fracture versus a true fragility fracture. They did, they did acknowledge that they didn't control for that. So, you know, I could put here um, a bunch of pelvis patients with cracks in their pelvis uh, that we did nothing to and they healed fine. I could put a bunch of x-rays up here of patients with minimally displaced uh, uh, fractures that we placed screws in and they did all fine. But here, here's something a little bit different and, and hopefully it gets you to critically think about these injuries and not just be reflexive and say, well, you know, my mentor said that he's done this for 30 years and he's never had to treat one of these. And, or, or the other person says, well, my mentor, or what I see, I treat all these. If there's a, there's a break in there, they got to get fixed. So uh, I think all of us hope that you think about this critically as you, as you evaluate these patients. So here's a 90-year-old patient, ground level fall. You see there's a you know, minimal deformity. You see there's a fractures within the obturator ring on the right. Here's the ghosted reconstructions, the AP and the inlet outlet. So pretty minimal deformity. Uh, on the CT scan, you can see a, uh, you know, a fracture of the ala on the right that exits out the posterior ilium. Um, so we'd have to calculate Dr. Haller's score on this one, but uh, her and her family didn't want surgery. She actually felt pretty good. She, she was relieved if the option was no surgery. Thank goodness, doctor, I don't have to have surgery because we kind of gave her the options. If you're feeling uncomfortable getting up, we can do a, a relatively small surgery for you. Uh, so she elected uh, non-op and she was seen at a week in our clinic. Um, and she had relatively mi minimal pain with a, with a walker. Here's her x-ray. So I would say that's more deformity than she had before, but you know, reasonable. Comes back at a month. So now she has minimal pain. She's walking with her walker, which is baseline for her. Uh, I would say that's even more uh, deformity. I would, I would even say that's an EUA positive if that was what I saw in fluoroscopy. Still didn't want anything, doing fine. So then she comes back at six months. I have no idea why she came back. You know, half of my patients don't come back even at six months, but she came back, no pain, scooting around on her walker, pretty much back to her baseline pre-injury. Um, and this is her x-ray, right? So, you know, that is a substantial internal rotation deformity. 
Her ischial um, uh, tuberosities are off in height. Her hip heights are off. Um, so I would call this a radiographic failure of treatment, right? A radiographic malunion. Um, but she doesn't care. She's getting around at baseline. And so, you know, treating patients based on, you know, their overall, you know, kind of performance status may be relevant in these kind of injuries. So, you know, this is not the x-ray you would want for your kid who has their whole life ahead of them. But if it's your elderly parent and they have a high perioperative injury and risk, uh, uh, regardless, you may elect for not upper treatment that they may be just fine with. So hopefully this uh, kind of uh, motivates some, some spirited discussion. I'll turn it over to Dr. Nascone to, uh, to lead us in some cases. Oh, actually, let me give a summary. Sorry, first. Do pelvis fractures hurt? Yes. Do fixing them uh, make people feel better? Yeah, we have some research to support that. It may be a little bit, um, and it may not reach your MCID, uh, but it, I don't think there's a question that there's, there is some pain benefit with uh, fixing these. It may be unreliable in certain patients. Should you fix all of them just because of pain? Probably not. Should you fix some of them because of pain? Probably. And I hope you recognize the difference between a true uh, LC1 fracture uh, versus a fragility fracture. And my screen is not sharing. Let me see here why this isn't working. There we go. Well, good evening. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Connor. Thank you, Justin. Connor, thanks for inviting me. Justin, good seeing you. Good talk. So I have a series of cases I was going to talk about here. And, you know, the thing that's interesting, you know, we're an interesting bunch. We're, you know, we're surgeons and uh, we try to follow the literature and follow the data and you know one of the problems in the pelvis is it's really horrible data that's out there right i mean we're all authors on a lot of these papers that you saw that was you know we've presented but the data that's out there isn't that great right we don't have the problem is we we really have trouble connecting the dots so we can have some sort of correlation or intra-observer agreement about different stress radiograph techniques or we can comment on pain, or we can comment on amounts of displacement that happen during healing with different fractures, but it's really difficult for us to pull it all together, right? So, okay, you have this fracture and it goes on to heal with this deformity and therefore you have this problem, right? That's, we, we, we have trouble making that sequential jump. So we have little pieces of it or glimmers of information and then we try to sort of pull it all together. And then the other thing that you'll see is we have a lot of people in the pelvic world that have a lot of opinions and there's some very strong opinions. And a lot of us are, 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 um, are, are guided by our worst, you know, our last thing that happened to us that was real bad or the last thing that happened to us that was real good. So you'll hear stories about, well, you know, I, I had this minimally displaced pelvis fracture and, you know, I treated it non-operatively and it went on to this horrible malunion. So now I fix all of them or, I was operating on somebody and, you know, I gave them an S1 uh, radiculopathy. And, you know, so I really think we should not operate on these people. And so it just, it's just sort of our nature as to how we're, we're guided uh, in, in the things that we do. And I don't know what the answers are to these. I think that, um, you know, personally, I think it's important to be thoughtful. And you hear that from both of the talks that, that you heard earlier tonight. Um, the tendency or the trend that I see in young, uh, you know, trauma surgeons coming out is fix them all, just fix them all. It's easy to do. And there's, you know, then you don't have to worry about it. And I, I, I do worry about that a bit because I think you're still subjecting someone to surgery. And although we're good at these techniques, you know, I have someone right now that I'm nursing along that has an S1 radiculopathy from an errant S1 screw. And they're miserable. It's, you know, they really are debilitated by it. And so it's rare, you know, those kind of complications are rare, but they can happen. So 
I, I just, you know, I guess what I would ask is for a thoughtful approach and sort of what you heard from Connor too, a thoughtful approach to these patients, a, a wide majority of these patients that, you know, may meet the criteria that have been outlined uh, in the earlier talks may be just fine without surgery. And it's, it's hard to distinguish. I mean, that's, that's the dilemma, right? How do we distinguish who they are? And um, there's the three, the, the main drivers, I think that you're going to see in most of the centers are going to be, you know, people are going to be arguing for, um, you know, and we're talking about a pelvis that is well aligned, right? We're not talking about a pelvis that is malaligned. That's a different animal. We're talking about well aligned pelvis. And there's a, you know, there's people, there's groups that are going to look at it, the static films and the CT and make a decision. There's groups that are going to look at some sort of dynamic exam, you know, such as a, a stress radiograph. And then there's groups that may focus on pain or patient centered, um, issues, right? You know, uh, you know, uh, we push on aunt Jenny's hips and she hurts. Uh, therefore, we're going to fix her, right? And and so, it's I don't know what the right answer is, but you'll see. Recognize, I just I think it's important for everyone to recognize that there's different things that are being done in different centers, and there's different drivers for who needs surgery. So that's my preference for the cases. So, first one is, that we're going to talk about is 32 year old isolated pelvic fracture. She's in an MVC. She has uh, comes in with this injury. She's got a. Uh, uh, what appears to be uh, a sacral fracture on the left side. She's got this ramus fracture, superior ramus fracture, but then she's got sort of this segmental component to it. So there's some increasing anterior ring instability, uh, I, I would argue. And you look at her overall, her overall ring looks pretty good to me. I mean, I think that the symmetry of her ring looks pretty good. Um, and uh, we look at her CT scan, she's got a complete sacral fracture. So this is the bad actor, right? This is the one we're worried about. This is the fracture that could potentially displace. And so the displacement that we worry about seeing in these types of fractures, you know, or the malunion that we'll see in these simple LC1s that we worry about is we worry about internal rotation deformity, sorry, but primarily, it's a leg length discrepancy that they get, right? So they internally rotate, well, so what? So I guess it could be an issue if they have some, you know, dyspareunia or issues like that with internal rotation. But the other problem with internal rotation is you shorten your leg. And so that to me is the issue, right? If they get a shortened leg or their ischial heights are different and they have sitting imbalance, you know, that's a huge deal. So, you know, that's what we're worried about. So I'm gonna ask the panel here, you know, here, here's what we have. These are just static films at this point, right? And and I, I, I'm going to throw in that, you know, I'm not a huge fan of EUA because I'm not sure how to interpret EUA. And we can say that, you know, you push on it, and it moves to a certain amount, and then that's going to be positive for some people. But, you know, my one of my partners, Bob O'Toole, will say, well, you know, if you take the humerus fracture and you uh, uh, twist it and push on it, it's going to hurt, number one. So if you're using pain, that, that, that it will hurt because they're broken. And two... Yeah, I can displace it all over the place, but that doesn't mean anything as far as their overall outcome and how they're going to heal. So I just throw that out there because I'm not sure personally what a, a positive EUA is. You're going to see in some of my cases, they actually have EUAs um, and it's sort of variable as far as when they get them. Uh, I'm not sure what the actual role is for EUA. I mean, for me, it's, it's the most important role for EUA is to find a contralateral injury um, that I don't know about, like an occult a, you know, APC injury on the contralateral side, but I really, and you're going to see from some of these cases, I have a hard time interpreting what, what a positive injury, what a positive L, um, uh, EUA is on an LC. So what do you guys think on this? Any, any, any thoughts, uh, Connor, Justin on this? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I've, I think I've evolved to, um, I, I rarely do my own EUA or an EUA for myself, I would say. Um, and I think that an EUA is different for different people. Um, but I think that a lot of people just use it to justify what they were going to do anyway. And so if they're worried about it and they're like, I think that needs a screw, they go and they push on it and they say, ah, oh, look, it moved. And, uh, therefore we must put this screw. Or if it's something they think is stable and doesn't need it, they push a little bit and it doesn't move much. And they say, see, it, it's stable. It's fine. And so I, I think that that's in practice what a lot of people end up using it for. Um, I think it can help uh, at, when you're starting out in practice. Uh, I think there is a learning curve to understanding the static imaging to these. So you look at something and you're like, oh, that's, that's, that 
that's quote unstable in my mind. It may have been informed by by doing a few of these and pushing on them. But after you after you look at quite a few of these, you you, you sort of learn what they're going to do, and so you're not surprised when you push on it. We think, Justin, is this a is this a nine or a ten? I mean, this is this is <laughs> high up, right? I, I don't know what the scoring is, but this is definitely high. It's twelve. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think this is definitely high. Um, you know, segmental parasympathetic and with a complete sacrum. Um, I would certainly worry about the stability of the anterior pelvis for this one. And I mean, I think EUA here's what I would dial up, even though both of you weren't weren't too um, weren't too interested in that. Um, the reason is, and I think. Um, the recent studies, both out of our shop and out of Colorado that support doing EUA outside of the operating room, so it's a little less biased, I think is a little more palatable for me to want to get that information beforehand just to see the amount of displacement. There's still certain issues that you both raised that I kind of brought up in the talk where it's like, how do you judge it and um, how what measurements actually useful. Um, I assume that the EUA is going to show me the maximum amount of displacement that's going to happen with that injury and um, kind of make a decision if I feel like that's going to be tolerated or not based on if they heal in that position. Now that's purely subjective as we've kind of uh, discussed um, that we don't exactly know how much each person's going to tolerate, right? um, but we think it's a centimeter or more is probably gets a surgery and, and less than that doesn't, but yeah, it's not really driven by much of much outcome data. Yeah. So how I mean, are you I, measuring the centimeter, Justin? What's the centimeter? Yeah, I mean, you can measure uh, your, like on a, usually these people have a CT scan beforehand. You can measure um, how thick their superior ramus is and then uh, try to get an idea of, okay, if, if based on where their parasympathetic fracture is, if they go to the midline, well, that's probably going to be about a centimeter or something like that. Or if there's a hundred percent displacement of your superior ramus and you've measured it to be about a centimeter on your um, coronal cut CT scan, you can probably, uh, you can get an idea, but it's not exact. You, you know, I, I definitely, if I have somebody in the operating room, I will push on them because I'm curious, right? I just want to see what, I want to see what I'm just getting. I want to learn about it and see what they do. So I definitely do push on people, but I'm just not sure how to interpret it. You know, I, I'm with you that I just, and I think that it's maybe different on different days. You know, I think there's in looking at these cases when I, you know, these, these are over a bunch of years, I was looking back at them and I saw the EUAs, you know, like I have an EUA on this one and I looked at it and I was like, well, maybe I would do something with, this. I don't know, but you know, so this is, this is no push. And then that's the push. Right. And so, I don't have the whole series, you know, the whole, you know, 15, 15 different images here. I just have this one. And, but I mean, to me, this shows some internal rotation deformity through the sacrum. And it certainly shows, I mean, I, I don't know, to me, that looks like that's probably a centimeter displacement. I don't know. I'm just eyeballing that, but maybe that's, you know, I mean, is this a positive EUA, I guess, is what I'm, you know, what I, what I would ask the panel. For me, it would be um, both from the anterior displacement, but more impressively is in the back. I mean, usually with the EUA, you don't get that much internal rotation through the sacrum. So um, for me, this would be a, a positive EUA. We push really hard in Baltimore. Yeah, you guys are strong. <laughs> I, I think All this right. is a positive if you are an EUA person. Yeah. <laughs> If you're somebody that says, I, I, the EUA is going to tell me what to do, then, then that's a positive one. If, if, if you don't care about EUAs, I think you're treating it based on the imaging, uh, the static imaging beforehand. And, and uh, I really like your, your scale and how it breaks down the, the sacrum because, I don't know, your thoughts, Jason, people see a complete sacrum, complete sacral fracture. That can mean a lot of things, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, but I'm not sure what, I'm not sure. I, I don't think just because you have all of the things, let's say that are outlined in the Riley Bruce paper of segmental rami and a complete sacral fracture. I don't think all of them go on to have horrible deformity and problems right now. Maybe they heal with some residual displacement, but again, just like we were talking at the beginning, I was talking at the beginning, we don't have the jump as to what happens to them functionally. Now, you know, and maybe it's just totally fine. I don't, I don't know, but I guess 
but I would implore, you know, we have, I don't know how many people, we have 100 people, 108 people on here tonight, you know, so I would just ask that, you know, people think about this, that like, we don't know, right? And it's like, to look at that and say, oh, well, that moves, we have to fix it. I, I don't know that that's true, right? I mean, I, but you you might guess wrong, right? You might guess wrong sometimes and, and have some problems. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's certainly right. And um, that their definition of displacement was just moving more than five millimeters, which yeah. from the other studies that would still be in the non-displaced group. Um, so you're, you're totally right. It's, it's a matter of like what you consider significant. Um, the recent paper at a, at a Ural's shop um, would suggest that, you know, the five to 10 group, you know, they do do better, not maybe with a significant pain, pain score difference, but their pain scores were like two and change better in that five to 10 group, not yeah. suggesting that's, um, that's like a solid cutoff, but, um, but I agree with you. And, um, I, I liked your point about the humerus fracture. Like if you just move a humerus, it's going to go wherever you want. Um, that's why I, I think the pelvis is more like the ankle. Cause there's a lot of ligamentous, uh, stability, soft tissue stability. Um, and so that's how I look at it as more of a, more like the ankle and the stress view that we do with the ankle. Um, sure. And that's exactly right. So that maybe is the point, like you think about how we used to be with stress positive uh, ligamentous SER4s, right? So you had a stress positive mortise, it would displace. And that was an absolute indication for surgery. Well, now the pendulum swung back that like maybe, maybe if the mortise is reduced and you can maintain the reduction through healing, they don't need surgery, right? It's just, it's, I, I just throw it out as I think it, we think it's interesting, right? I mean, yeah, and I, totally. I don't know that we know the answers. Um, and I don't know, want everybody on this talk to think I'm the EUA guy. We'll get on the panels. We'll get you up. Ask Claude. He loves it. He loves it. <laughs> the, uh, the thing I'd push back, Justin, is the ankle is, is you know, that's an articular issue, right? So For sure. instability ankle, articular post-traumatic arthrosis very quickly. Whereas if you push on something and it moves seven millimeter or let's say nine millimeters, so it doesn't reach the one centimeter and then it heals like that. So what? Yeah. Uh, what happened? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. So, I mean, I treated this one non-op and, and so, you know, you look here, she is at two weeks. And I think to me, this ring looks still looks pretty good. I don't see any displacement. Um, any real displacement. And then, you know, she comes back at three months and she's healed, healed enough that she's walking on it without assistive devices, doesn't have a limp um, and no displacement of the ring. So I, I again, one case, right? I, I mean, I'm just, and I can show you one went the other way too, but, you know, just something to think about. Jason, there was a question from the um, participants. Uh, I thought it was a good question just to kind of pull all of us. Uh, what is your non-operative treatment? So you, you see one of these rings and you say, this is non-op. What's your weight bearing? What's your follow-up x-ray protocol? So with the complete sacral fracture or with a fracture that's at risk, let's say that one that we were, you know, Justin was commenting about, I'm worried about that anterior ring or, you know, some other, there's something else with that fracture that you're a little worried about. I protect their weight bearing on the affected side. So I have them foot flat weight bearing. I see them in seven to 10 days and get x-rays in the office because I want to know if, if something bad is going to happen, I want to know early. One, the biggest problem that we get into with this is, you know, the horse is out of the barn. Like they come in at seven or eight weeks, the thing's displaced. And now it's a huge big deal, right? That's the worry. And so I tend to see them every two weeks. Um, and uh, protect their weight bearing up to six weeks and then, then let them go to full weight bearing after that is, is what I do. I don't know if you guys, you guys do stuff similar to that or, or. Pretty similar to that. I mean, if it's like an incomplete sacrum, then they can be full weight bearing. We get immediate mobilization yeah. films or something like yeah. that. But, but the ones you're talking about, yeah, exactly. Touchdown weight bearing with follow-up. So we, and... we used to do films like in the, in the hospital, like, oh, get them up, get an x-ray. We sort of stopped doing that because I don't know that there was, I, I feel like there wasn't a huge yield to that. I, I feel like I didn't, I didn't see much on those, but it's like at that one week mark, I tended to see a little bit more. Great. So, so this is this is another case, and this came out right when the classic paper, we'll say, of the Riley, you know, the Riley Sims paper came out. It, it probably was right around that time, right? So I had just read that paper. I was like, oh, that's a good paper, you know, uh, you know, this is a, you know, this young guy. He's got segmental rami fractures on the one side. He actually has 
bilateral rami fractures. He's got a little internal, maybe a little internal rotation, but he's got this contralateral uh, LC, uh, LC1 complete sacrum. There's a CT. Maybe not as bad as the last one, but it's a complete sacral fracture. And now I have I have this new information. I had the, you know, the whatever that paper was, 2010, 20, 2011. So I have that information. I have this fracture. What do you guys think? EUA, Justin, EUA. Yeah, you're showing all like all the all the indeterminate ones that I'm uh yeah, I mean, I think this one again would be uh, we would get a, a stress view in the emergency department to help guide whether there's an, enough displacement that we would want to fix it. I mean, but I think that's the, I think that's the fracture we're talking about, right? I mean, we're talking about the indeterminate ones. Like, I don't think any of us are going to fix the stable LC1 that has the anterior sacral crunch and the minimally displaced rami fractures. That's going to be, to your point, that's going to be weight bearing is tolerated. And then the obliterated one that's already internally rotated or shifted back, that's getting surgery, right? So these intermittent ones, indeterminate ones are the gray zones, right? That I think, I definitely think we struggle with. Um, so I UA this guy, that looks, that's over a centimeter, I would say. I can't measure, but that looks to be over a centimeter to me. You guys agree? Yeah, yeah I, I would. I would say so. Yep. Well, there's your inlet. I gave you, I gave you a whole bunch here. So he's got some displacement in the back. What do you guys want to do? I'd, I'd fix that. I would have fixed it without the EUA, Jason. I think, I think when you have the worst anterior ring injury contralateral to the posterior ring injury, for me, that, that seems more unstable to me. Yeah. I, I would agree. And I, you know, in, in all, you know, full disclosure, my bet is we were planning, you know, the barber chair effect, we were planning on fixing this guy. And I just, I wanted to see what he did. You know, I just was, I was curious to see what his pelvis did. So he had a distraction frame in the front, Ramus screw and a, and, a, and a screw in the back. And, you know, he went on to do fine. Right. So to your point, I think Connor made the point, like, well, sometimes you'll see them with screws in, sometimes you'll see them without and they, you know, and, and I don't know that we're always guessing right. I, I think that a lot of times there's a lot of these people that we operate on that probably don't need it. Um, but um, we're trying to we're trying to avoid a potential problem. Yeah, Jason, can I comment on that? Because I made a sure. little flippant flippant comment earlier that I said, you know, the treatment is a seven millimeter incision and, and, and who cares? But, in, you know, I was being a little sarcastic. There are complications. You mentioned the nerve policy. You know, we, we see them once in a while where we're screws are placed out of the sacrum um and I, I just saw a case literally today uh somebody forwarded it to me where um a person was diagnosed with post um trauma or you know orthosis of the um of the si joints bilaterally and got you know multiple fusion implants into both si joints and so if you take an lc1 that would have otherwise healed fine and then you put screws in it. And then later on, they say, well, now they have arthritis there. And then they get a second, even more aggressive procedure of fusion implants into their SI joints. Now, granted, you know, there's a lot of reasons why that story could have played out that way, but you know, th it's not totally benign to, to shove metal in people. Yeah. I mean, stuff happens, right? I mean, it definitely happens. Absolutely. And if you look at, you know, if you look at sort of you know, ask patients about what they want, you know, like sort of do discrete choice stuff for different, various different surgeries and stuff. Like the big one is like, they don't want to die, you know, that that's bad. And they don't want like complications, you know, they don't want to have problems, you know, and a lot of times it's not like, are they worried about, a, uh, you know, you know, my, a little bit of a, a, a liquidity when they walk or something like that. that's usually not what it is. It's usually the big stuff that, that affects them. All right. So what I have one last Oh, okay, sorry. Another uh, question from the audience, just uh, asking us about our observations um, on mobilization. You know, they, they, we, we, I showed them the data, but they wanted to know our opinion on if, if it truly helps people mobilize or not. I, I personally don't think it really does, but um, that's just my, you know, and I, I don't think that there's a huge effect on pain. I mean, it's, one, one to two points. So, I mean, is that a huge effect or not a huge effect? I guess that's the question. And I think you could use it either way. Like you could say, that's really not that much when you look at the overall pain, you know, what, what the, you know, minimum, you know, the, the, the minimally clinical important differences, or it's, 
you know, it's a huge difference if you're talking about for some people. I, I don't, and I just, it's, it's, it's small, I think. Yeah, I think it gets back to one of your points that you had in your talk, Connor, about um, like patient agents, who they are. I think in general, old people are pretty tough. And if they're having a hard time mobilizing, like you give them a few days and they're still in, the, in bed, I have put um, screws in those patients. And anecdotally, they do better. Um, who knows if that third day they would have done better anyway. Um, but if it's an old person, I think it's going to help them mobilize um, from a pain standpoint. I will um, put screws in. There's a couple, I think one, maybe a study out there uh, demonstrating that it's, um, it can be helpful in old people. But I think young people, like you pointed out, are um, kind of a different animal. They could probably mobilize just fine um, without any kind of uh, fixation. And usually they're not quite as tough as, as older people. So I, I, I value what older people have to say about whether their um, pain is restricting their mobilization. Yeah, that's been my observation too. You know, you, you know, young males are quite wimpy. Um, and so regardless of what you do, they're, they're going to be slow to mobilize. Um, and a young person, you put a screw in and you say, do you feel better? They say, yeah. And if you have an elderly person with a lot of pain and you say, you know, do you feel better? Like, oh my God, I feel so much better. It's, it's much more dramatic. You know, it's different than if you have a crack in your sacrum versus when you're rolling in bed, your pelvis is rattling around. And, and I think that's a little bit more with the elderly fragility fractures, they're just sort of crunching in there. And I think it hurts quite a bit. Whereas, you know, a young person, they got a crack and yeah, if you push on them hard, it'll move a little bit, but I just don't know if that pain will matter. I think that gets back to more of the, what, what the research shows and, and, and sort of, it, you know, does it reach your MCID or not? I mean, I also think there's a factor. You tell someone, we're going to take you to surgery and do, do this procedure on you, and you're going to feel better after we do it because we want to reduce your pain. I think about 30 to 40% of them are going to feel better regardless because you just did something to them. I mean, you, you probably do a sham incision on them and they probably would feel better. So I, I don't know, you know. That's the study that would needs to happen. Yeah, <laughs> well, there's a lot of that that needs to happen, but it's never going to, anyway, that stuff's never going to happen. You can do the VA or something. Yeah, right. All right. So the last case, I'm going to run through it quick, but I mean, I think this is an important one because this is sort of the thing that we were, I worry about. So this was a girl, 23 year old, she's in a car crash. You know, she came in right at the changeover of rounds, you know, so this was, she came into the, you know, our trauma bay uh, in the morning and uh, she didn't have any of her other imaging, right? She had an AP pelvis and I think she had her CT at that point. And so I wanted to get inlet outlets, but we were in the operating room doing other stuff. I said, well, you know, follow up with me, you know, once she gets her final films, but uh, this is what she had. She's got a sacral fracture on the left side. She's got this, uh, she's got a segmental uh, rami fracture on the left side. And she also has contralateral injury, uh, injury as well. So I didn't have any of the other films at this point. Um, at, at this point, I didn't have these films. Um, but she's got a little internal rotation of her inlet there. Um, uh, the AP or the uh, outlet looks, I think, looks pretty good. But that inlet to me looks, you know, in, in hindsight, looks like she's got a fair amount of internal rotation deformity. And I, I, I might I might have been on that one, you know, in, in retrospect now. But I didn't because I didn't have that info. I had this. I had the CT. And so she has, a, you know, a, you know, an arguably a complete sacral fracture, you know, although you don't see it come out the back, but it, it has the look like it, it probably was coming out the back. And she has these injuries in the front with this sort of segmental rami fractures. And so, you know, I, I you know, I, I'm going to ask the, the crew what they think about this, but you know, the way, the way this played out, I was going to treat her. I, I was going to treat this girl non-operatively. And I, I think largely it was because of the way I received the information and the way I looked at the films personally. Anybody do anything? Okay. Well, you guys jump on this right away. I mean, what's the, I, score? I what's the score, Justin? What's the score on this one? Uh, so it's a complete. There's. Um, it looks like it's tough to tell on that CT scan, but on the inlet X-ray, it looks like. Um, I don't know. It's hard to tell if there's two millimeters displacement or not, but um, I bet there is. Um, but maybe not. So we'll we'll just we'll say it's less than two, but it's complete sacrum. Um, parasympathetic, comminuted inferior ramus. I mean, she's probably a 12. Um, and so she's probably, based on that scoring system, is 
would be indicated for surgery um, versus doing an EUA just to further evaluate her stability. But to me, she's already fairly internally rotated on that inlet that you got, but you could further confirm that with a with an EUA, but I'd probably just do surgery for her, honestly. I think there's a real tweener for, for me, Jason. You know, I think that inlet uh, wasn't a perfect inlet either. It was slightly rotated. So, you know, you could have been, you know, I easily could have said, ah, oh, that still looks pretty good. Um, I don't like this sacrum on the CT as much as that other one you showed, you know, just uh, that, that first sacral segment looks like there is, uh, you know, there's more gap there that implies to me there was more impaction as it went through. But, you know, I agree, there's there's minimal deformity. And, and I think that if you said, well, they want to mobilize child not up, I think, I think that's a very reasonable plan. So if you think if she heals where she is right now, do you think there would be a functional problem with her? Or do you think she'd be okay? Not that I've observed, um, you know, and it's tough in trauma, right? You know, people leave and they don't come back, but you know, the, the malunion I showed the only dramatic one I have in, you know, eight, nine years here was somebody treated from a, in an outside country, non operatively for something nobody would treat. So I don't see some scourge of malunions flooding around the country, but maybe that's because I'm young enough that we've treated, you know, we're sort of safely on that side of treating more than we need to. Um, and, 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 you know, that, that, that's the success of that. And that's why I don't see a ton of, uh, of malunions, obviously that they exist. Right. But I see it more. The only time I see it is when there's an, um, uh, you know, a ligamentous injury that was treated insufficiently. Those are the mal, you know, the deformities that I've seen. Yeah. Let me, let me run through this one quick. Cause we're, we're sort of, we're at the end point. I want to have time to answer some questions too. So I treated her non-op. And this is her, um, you know, I, I saw her at, at 10 days. This is her at three weeks. Uh, she's been um, uh, foot flat weight bearing on the left side. Uh, I, I was pretty happy with the way the pelvis looked. The AP pelvis here looked, it actually looked better to me than the other images. And I thought her inlet and uh, outlook looked pretty good here. Um, but I was still protecting her. And so I, and then she comes back to me at six weeks complaining of pain. And so I, I think this is, to me, this is the worry that with the, 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 ink, the complete LC1, like this is the, the, the one when you come into clinic and you're like, oh, and you see it because she's not only is she internally rotated, but you look at her outlet and she's short. She's about a centimeter and a half short now. And so my worry is, you know, the bone is healing and she's in this position. Is she going to need osteotomies? Am I going to need mobilizer mobilize her sacrum? What, you know, what are we going to need to do to get her back where she belongs? And uh, I'm going to just, I'm going to cut to the chase a little bit here. So I, I see Peter just to look to see how much healing, but you can see she's got more internal rotation deformity. She's got callus. Now, you know, the good news is, you know, she moved, you know, so I could distract her back out with a distractor, sort of get her uh, opened up through her SI joint, and I stabilized her all the way around the ring. So she's got, you know, fully threaded screws in the front to keep her from collapsing in, transiliac, transsacral in the back, and I left the frame on her. And, you know, she healed it with good alignment. I got her height back. She's, pain, you know, she's got issues that are probably happening from that SI joint on the left side. And, you know, I, I don't know if, if, you know, doing her early would have alleviated that. Maybe it would have, maybe it wouldn't have. But, um, you know, this to me is the one that, you know, and I, I was telling the guys when we were doing our pre-course, you know, I, you see it once, once every two years, maybe, you know, so for all of these fractures that we're talking about that need surgery or don't need surgery or need EUAs, you probably see this problem once every two years, I think. Is that is that fair to say, guys? Or do you think it's or you're you're operating on enough that it's not, you don't see it. I mean, that that would be the other way to do it. You just fix, you know, if you fix them all. Yeah, I think that where you lie on that spectrum, right? If you're fixing more than you need to, you'll probably have more complications of screws, but less malunions. And if you're not treating enough, then you're gonna have the occasional malunion or deform yeah. early deformity that you have to correct. Yeah, but I agree, you know, it's, when you see something like that, you're like, oh my gosh, now what, right? I've gone from a perk screw to a, you know, some sort of crazy deformity case. Yeah, and it, and it changes you, right? And so you're now you're gun shy for the next 15, 15 pelvises you see. You're going to probably be more aggressive. I mean, you, you'll do that with any. I mean, I think in any area that we operate on, I, I feel like it's just our human nature to do that, to be honest with you. 
Jason, yeah, that, was a, that was a great save. I mean, that, that case looked really, really awesome. And I mean, at three weeks, I thought for sure you were I in the clear, right? Too. Yeah. I mean, that I looked really great did. with her alignment, but. Jason, wild. there was an additional question that I thought um, was a good one to just kind of uh, you guys to discuss as well, because we mentioned it and kind of comes back to this case is, is the idea of complete versus incomplete sacrum fracture. And, and so, you know, you say, well, you know, if it's broken, it's broken. It has to be complete. And, you know, my sense is that, you, you know, we're, we're sort of using the term complete, which is a categorical variable, right? Complete or incomplete. Uh, and, and ideally we would want a continuous variable of, of the true nature of the injury. And, and so the term complete typically is, is, you know, can you see it all on the CT scan? Not that you're saying an incomplete means there's not a fracture. It may mean that it incomplete goes into the SI joint. It exits into the, into the posterior ilium, or you just, you know, because of their osteopenia, you can't visualize it or the cuts, you know, what are your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think all of those ones, those simple LC ones that are just like, you know, grandma falls, I bet if you MR'd her, you'd see, you'd see edema going all the way through the sacrum. I, I, the one I worry about is when you see the fracture going all the way through on the CT. Uh, that's, that's, for me, is that bad actor or the one that, that, that just, you know, makes my, I get a little more attentive on. Yeah, especially zone two, you know, transforaminal. And yep. if you see fragmentation within the foramen, you know, th that to me is a sort of a much worse actor. Yeah, I think um, like the one you just presented where you had some gapping in the, in the sacrum, that's like, that's like what you're getting at where it's going to be a little yeah. bit more unstable than say uh, a compressed down um, zone one type fracture. Uh, Justin, there was a question about if you could expand uh, on the sacral columns uh, from, your, from the scoring system, just kind of review that. Uh, yeah, so uh, it gets back to the idea that there's um, like there's a one, two, and three where three is complete. One is kind of th through the anterior third, two is through the anterior two thirds, but not quite all the way complete. And three is, is um, complete all the way through. So you're really um, trying to quantify the severity of the sacral fracture with that? Yeah, a little bit like what you're talking about with continuous variable, but just breaking out one, two, and three instead of just binary. Great. Well, great. Well, we've uh, kind of gone over time, but, uh, you know, really thank uh, both of you for a great webinar. Um, you know, great audience questions and, uh, you know, a tough topic. Clearly, we didn't give you every answer for every patient, but I, I think all of us, uh, we, you know, we hope that you think about these critically uh, and, and uh, you know, with the benefit of your patients. So thanks, everyone, for, for uh, logging in and uh, see you next time. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Thanks, Connor. Thanks, Jason. Good to see you all.